Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, my name is Cindy. And I'm Andrew. And we're here from Turnstile Tours today as special guests, um, kicking off a series um, that the Street Vendor Project is going to be doing um, uh, of virtual programs highlighting the stories of street vendors. Um, so we're so pleased today to share some of the history of street vending in New York City. Um, but before we do that, we're actually going to go live um, to Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, uh, who is the deputy director of the Street Vendor Project. She's out in Midtown with one of our favorite street vendors, uh, Royal Halal Grill. And we're going to get the chance to talk to her about the Street Vendor Project and how things are going with the vendors that they work with. Um, and also get to do a little bit of a cooking demo before we dig into the history of street vending. Yeah, and before we dive into the program, uh, we'll give people just another minute or so to, uh, to log on. Um, and just to give you uh, a little um, idea of how it's going to work uh, over the next hour, uh, we really encourage you to interact, share your questions, share your stories. Uh, if you have street vendors that you're particularly missing right now, I know we have a lot um, that we're missing. Um, please feel free to share that uh, in the chat. So you can find that down at the bottom of the screen. Um, so type away and if you want to share, you know, just your name and where you're joining us from. We're going to be taking questions throughout the program, so it won't just be at the end. Um, so feel free to drop those in the, ch the chat. Uh, and behind the scenes, uh, we have uh, Fatai with us and he is um, going to be helping us produce. So he'll also be dropping resources into the chat and links to the things um, and uh, you can engage with us that way. Yeah, and it's we do, you know, what we do uh, in, in normal times is we have a tour that we do um, where we feature the stories of different vendors around the city. And uh, we really miss doing that. And we love making these pro pro our programs as interactive as possible. So mm -hmm. if you have stories or people want to practice using the chat, you can select all panelists and attendees to talk to everybody. Um, and just kind of share some of the, the foods you either miss or maybe you're eating from a lot of street vendors these days. So um, if you want to share that or you want to share where you're coming from today, um, it makes it, I think, a, a more fun experience for everybody. Yeah. Um, and if you're not familiar with the Street Vendor Project, um, Welcome and thank you so much for, for joining this event. If you're a longtime supporter, maybe you've been to the Vendi Awards. I know we have a number of committee members that are joining us tonight as well. Um, thank you so much for, for joining and, and for your support. Um, but Karina is going to tell us a little bit more about the work that they're doing and especially the really vital work that they're doing um, in the midst uh, of this pandemic, which has impacted um, everybody, um, but, uh, you know, especially these very small businesses, um, you know, they haven't, a lot of street vendors have not had the same access to, you know, what, what supports there are out there to help businesses and individuals cope with the, cope with the uh, disruption of the pandemic. So we're going to be talking about that. And we're also going to be talking about that in the historical context as well. Um, but without further ado, um, we're going to invite uh, Karina to, to join us uh, from the streets of Midtown. Hi everybody. Hey. <laughs> How's it going? Good, good. How are you? <laughs> good. Uh, my name is Karina and so excited to be here with everybody and to get to welcome everybody to the first of our virtual events, uh, Street Vendor Stories, where we're going to be getting to take everyone to visit vendors around the city and support vendors, especially during this you know, really difficult time. Um, so, who is the Street Vendor Project? We are a membership-based organization of over 2,000 street vendors across the five boroughs. Um, and as an organization, we've been around for about 20 years. And um, in our day-to-day -day work, we provide legal services to vendors and, and really strive to build power and community so that we, um, as the only, the only organization that works with street vendors, are amplifying the stories and the histories um, in our advocacy work and bringing street vendors to the forefront of policy debates about what do small businesses need? What do immigrants and military veterans need, especially during this time? Thank you so much, Karina. We really, we really appreciate that introduction. Could you share a little bit about the work that you're doing at the Street Vendor Project right now um, with vendors that are out in, in, in the city and um, how, how vendors are getting by and faring at this moment. 
Yeah, so this has been, um, you know, a, a really difficult time for, for everyone in New York City, but especially for street vendors, for our smallest businesses. Um, vendors, you know, they're essential businesses. And so many were continuing to work and ensure that um, neighborhoods and working folks still had access to fresh, affordable food throughout the pandemic. But for many, especially for, for older vendors, they were really unable to, to go to work because they also wanted to you know, take care of their, their health and safety. And many are the only, they're the primary caretakers in their family. And, and so you know, without having childcare access, um, had to really be home to make sure that their kids could be logging onto the internet. Um, and so it's been, a, it's been a really difficult time for our members. Um, a lot of folks in our community um, don't have immigration status, and so they've been ineligible for any of the federal support that's been out there. And for vendors, you know, a lot of the, the loans and grants that are available for small businesses, they, vendors aren't always considered small businesses when it comes time to, to open up this type of support, right? Like folks are, maybe you don't have the business documentation in order to apply. Or again, it comes down to immigration status. And this has been a, a really difficult time for folks. And so as an organization, you know, we, we rebounded, we recognized, and we know that our city, our state, our federal government doesn't, doesn't support immigrants, doesn't often um, support street vendors and recognize them as the critical, as a critical part of New York City's culture and economy and, and small business environment. And so the first thing we did was launch a GoFundMe um, of emergency relief for vendors. And so, so far, um, we've been able to support um, over 350 street vendors across the city with cash assistance cards um, to, you know, use as, as they, they see fit for folks. For some, it's, it's rent. For some, it's, you know, being able to buy the materials that they need in order to try to get back to work and, and rebuild their business. Um, and as an organization, you know, it's, we've been transitioning to being to being virtual as has turnstile tours and so it's been a mix of you know connecting to all the vendors in our community making sure that they are um, online access to facebook um, and supporting people not only through the emergency fund but supporting them in having access to to housing resources to legal resources to making sure information about health and safety is translated um, into the languages that they're most comfortable in, and continuing to organize, continuing to organize for just working conditions for vendors and for inclusion in any um, any benefits that exist out there to make sure that vendors are are valued as a huge part of the city. Thank, thank you so much. It's such important work that you're doing at the Street Vendor Project to support so many vendors out in the city. Um, and, uh, and we now, you know, with these virtual programs, today is the first time that we're doing them, but they're going to be held regularly. So we have another one um, that's soon to be announced that's coming up um, within the next month or so, right? Yeah, so upcoming, um, you know, this is just, just part one to kick us off. Um, our next um, monthly event is going to be a showing of white sauce hot sauce, which, um, you know, shows folks who are, who immigrated from Egypt and are working in halal cards across the city to kind of share their stories as well. And this will be online and will be in conversation with the director of the film. So in order to uh, stay tuned for that one, definitely um, follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, or on Twitter to be checking out for when we, when we announce that date. And we just had a question actually uh, from Alicia who said, uh, will there be any more action for the uh, Fund Excluded Workers campaign? And how, how can people get involved in that? Yes. Great question. Yeah. So as an organization, right, we're not just we're not just doing legal services um, and direct services. We're also organizing for for systemic change, right? So one of our major campaigns that we're working on now is um, to ensure that there is um, benefits for folks 
who have not received any, including many vendors within our community. And that campaign is called Fund Excluded Workers. Um, and we're part of that with other organizations like Make the Road, Nail Salon Workers, Laundry Worker Center, from um, a lot of folks who, who work with immigrants across New York City and, and you know, a lot of essential workers who've kept, who've kept the city running, right? During, especially during COVID and haven't been supported in any way. So we'll definitely be um, continuing actions with this. Um, the best way to support right now is really to be calling your city council, or sorry, calling your um, state assembly and senate um, to make sure that they are paying attention and signing on. Um, and you can visit fundexcludedworkers.org for more information and to see some sample call scripts and a petition as well to sign up and share. Thank you, thank you so much, Karina. You can um, see we have another uh, our, another guest on the program here. This is our dog. Our Sophie. dog has been to some of the actions and protests in the past and uh, she's with in her hot dog suit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, um, so we, but but you're also out in Midtown right now um, with uh, MD alum from Royal Halal Grill. Um, one of the Vendi Award winners uh, from recent years. And um, we're just so excited to also visit him and learn a little bit about his business and share his wonderful food with everyone. Hey, MD. <laughs> it's, great. it's great to see you, MD. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so, so MD and, and folks don't know uh, Royal Grill Halal Food uh, in Midtown. Um, it's actually one of the vendors that, that we feature on the tours that we're doing in normal times of, of Midtown food carts. Um, but it also, they serve some of the absolute best food. Um, and if anyone has tried their food and especially tried their uh, chicken pizza, um, feel free to drop that into the chat. So he's going to show us a little bit more up close um, of his food and, and his curbside kitchen right here. Yeah. Um, MD, uh, MD and his wife Hira have, have been running the business for about 15 years now. Yes. And uh, he's serving a customer at the moment, which is good news. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so it is a family business, much like most of the vendors that are out in the city, where a lot of times it's literally like a mom and pop business, um, where mom and dad are on the cart, and one of them has to go to take care of the kids. Um, so we're going to talk to MD in just a second here. Um, I especially love the chicken tikka from this, this particular cart. Um, Yes, so MD is about to, to make the, the tikka that you just mentioned and show us how he makes it. Oh, wonderful. MD, can you tell us about what you're making? I'm making the two dishes. One is called chicken tikka masala, the Indian dish. And uh, one is called uh, combo for this. Combo is in half lamb, half chicken, rice, salad, and vegetables. And tikka, I mean, same thing is basmati rice. And we can see uh, MD is sort of plating up right here. And in the foreground, there are all these delicious uh, sauces that you can choose from. So like uh, Karina said, our next event is going to be this film called White Sauce Hot Sauce. And oh, of, there we have of course, that's the staple uh, of so much halal food. And we'll talk more later on about the history of halal food uh, in New York, um, but we'll wait for it to come out. So here comes the, the red sauce. And then the last ingredient, which you don't find on any other cart, is uh, MD's homemade green sauce. MD, what are, what are some of the flavors that people uh, will encounter in that green sauce? That's so, so delicious. The green sauce has a like, secret flavor, is cilantro, garlic. They like the mostly garlic, the cilantro sauce flavor. 
because they have their own own Indian spice. And the tikka has a totally different way we make it. We make it the ginger, garlic paste, uh, cinnamon, and uh, Uh, we just lost you there oh, for a sorry, second. Oh, sorry, the sound just went out for just a second. Could you repeat that? Uh, the last thing? Last thing is the chikka come in uh, India, garlic paste, uh, cilantro, and uh, and yogurt. And then we mm -hmm. marinate it overnight. And every morning, then we serve it. Did you catch that? Yeah, okay. so... Ginger, garlic paste, yogurt, those are some of the key ingredients that go into their, their chicken. Um, there's a question here from the audience where um, I, oh, there's someone here that says that uh, the Royal Grill Halal Food has some of the best chicken tikka masala in the city. Um, and uh, it'd probably be helpful for us to share exactly where you guys are um, so people can come out and find you. Oh, the address, uh, we are 40, Midtown, 44th Street, and 6th Avenue Corner, and it's near to the HSBC Bank. Yeah, so folks know it's, it's, it, it's uh, on the west side of 6th Avenue, between 6th and 7th, uh, but right near the corner of 6th on 44th. Yeah. So look for the cart. Uh, so when, when MD uh, and his team won the Vendi Cup uh, a couple of years ago, uh, it was at these Vendies, actually, at the 14th Vendie Awards. Um, they had their cart completely rewrapped uh, with a picture of them holding the Vendi cup. So you can't miss it. So look for the cart that has the Vendi cup uh, on the side. Yeah, Karina, is it possible to back up and show us the cart in broad view? Someone mentioned that they live in West Virginia and they have to drive an hour to get uh, some halal food. Oh. I mean, it's, it's great to see customers there. Um, I know that this has been a challenging time, especially maybe there aren't as many people in Midtown these days. So it's really great to see uh, MD busy with customers at the moment. And, and yeah, MD, so, how's business been? Uh, business is uh, not too good, but it's, it's still OK. But before was more good. But now the pandemic. My customer mostly office people, you know, the office all are closed right now. Even they come in like 10% people come in outside. So 10% people is no work yet. So it's like a medium. So if we open everything, hopefully we'll get to normal. Yeah. If you if if, uh, if folks missed that, what what ND was saying is that like so many vendors in places like Midtown or the financial district, pretty much all of their customers are office workers. They're regular customers, so they're not reliant on you know tourists randomly finding them. They're 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 regular customers. Uh, and now with most of the offices closed, he said his his business is down at about 10% of what it was previously. And again, it's so, a normal time so now, to find two carts. Yeah, so now MD's gonna show us some of the spices that he yeah. uses. Yeah. This was jeera, cinnamon, powder, and cumin. This is the one I'm using for the, when I cook the rice. Um, Karina, can you sort of repeat? I, um, it was a little, it was hard, a little to hard to hear. hard to hear. Yeah, can you say it again? So he, is, he has cumin. cumin. Cinnamon, cinnamon, bay leaf, bay leaf, and uh, coriander. And coriander. Mm -hmm. And this is what he uses. This is rice when I make the spicy rice. This is what he uses to make the spicy rice. Um, we had a question, which is, uh, how hot is it in the cart? Oh, hundred twenty degrees. It's hundred and twenty degrees. Oh. <laughs> I can tell you it's the truth. <laughs> I'll tell you one, one thing we always try and do whenever it's miserable outside, if it's pouring rain, if it's snowing, if it's unbearably hot, we try and go out of our way to, to go to a street vendor because we know <laughs> what they're going through to serve people food. And so we try and support them, especially on those days. <laughs> Well, MD, we are so grateful for the time that you've spent with us um, today. And we hope that everybody, when they have the chance, will come out and eat some of your delicious food.
Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and, and uh, I'll teach everyone. So um, in, in uh, Bengali, uh, the word thank you is donobad. Um, oh, and what's this? So this is a combo. It's half tikka, half rice, half vegetable. And lamb. And lamb. Yeah. yeah. And lamb. Oh, that lamb oh, looks that's beautiful. that's making me so hungry. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and MD, what hours are you here? Oh, I come in 9 o'clock to 9. 9, nine to, to 9. Nine. Yeah, 7 days. So come through 44th and 6th six six from seven. 9 to 9, yeah, 7 my, days a week. Yeah, our number is 347 724 If we cannot find it, give us call, we give you the location. <laughs> so, and we had someone ask before about how vendors uh, advertise, um, and uh, Fatai already dropped it into the chat, but you can find them on Instagram. <laughs> See more great pictures of their food, um, but also uh, connect with them that way. Oh, this looks so good. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We, we, neither of us have eaten dinner yet. <laughs> <laughs> Only our dog Salty is eating dinner, so. <laughs> Great. Well, Karina, thank you so much for uh, for being the, uh, the the remote correspondent today. Yeah. And and thank you, MD. Don't know bad for the. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> but I miss you guys. Come outside. He said he misses everybody and come visit. We yeah. will, we will. We miss him and we have people in the chat that say they're gonna come uh, over the weekend. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you, thank yeah, you thank so you. much. Thank you guys. Thank uh, you, Karina. And, and Karina might be joining us a little bit more at the, uh, at the end of the program. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna dive into the second part of today's program. And the, the title is A Brief History of Street Vending. And we always find that, you know, so many of, so much of the history is relevant um, to what's happening today uh, in the street vending industry. And so this is obviously a huge topic to cover, um, but we're gonna um, touch on a few of our favorite stories, a few highlights that will hopefully give you a sense of kind of the, the broad sweep of the history of street vending in New York. It's, it's such an important part uh, of the city's culture, um, but also, um, you know, illuminate a few human stories as well from the past. Yeah. It is such a big topic to cover. Um, and so we're, you know, this could be a, a huge series, um, but we are looking forward to sharing some of the stories that we thought resonated the most. Mm -hmm. And I guess where we're gonna start is going back to some of the earliest documentation that we've been able to find that's about street vendors in New York City. And so we're gonna go all the way back to the early 19th century, um, we were able to find um, the Smithsonian um, archives. Uh, the Smithsonian Institution has this book that we can see on the screen. And again, feel free to jump in, share your stories, um, ask questions. Um, there's really so much to this topic. Um, and we'll try, to, uh, we'll try to respond to those and integrate them into the program as we go. Um, but here we're looking at a, a children's book from 1808, and this was at least for us so far, one of the earliest sources when we're looking back to the history of street vendors in New York. And you'll find too that, you know, there are certain periods of time that are better documented than others. And obviously, you know, this 1808, you know, there's no photographs, there's very little information that can be found because this is mostly working people. Um, you know, these are not people whose names appear in the newspapers or in the social register. And so we we're so lucky um, to find this resource, this book from 1808, um, to document, uh, you know, a, at least a little bit of what the life of a street vendor was like. And what's so interesting about um, this children's book, so Carly's asking, what about this children's book deals with street vendors? Actually, the whole book. So if we sort of move forward, you can see 
there's uh, different sections, and you can find this yourselves um, in the Smithsonian Archives if you want to take a deep dive. But the cries of New York, it's all about the calls that street vendors make. So you can see here's Milk Ho, and this is a person that's carrying milk. And then there's a description that this milk is actually coming from Long Island. And so they're bringing it in and walking around in lower Manhattan, going from door to door selling people their milk. And that's just one of many different street vendors that they highlight in this book. So we'll see a few other examples. On one hand, you have milk, which is available at the time. Um, hot corn, this is a girl that's carrying hot corn that she's selling here, um, a corn that was obviously available here. Um, we have here oysters. So from Long Island Sound, um, there's an oyster man who's calling out and telling you to get your oysters. Um, so these are, were some readily available foods that New Yorkers would eat back in that time. Um, and then you have even cattails. So you have a vendor that's selling from a cart cattails that people would use to stuff their beds. And this was especially common for working class people to use cattails for this purpose. And it just illustrates that for, for such a long time, New Yorkers were dependent upon so many of the products that they bought, you know, they were so dependent on street vendors. So, um, you know, there weren't really restaurants, there weren't <laughs> retail stores, there weren't department stores. A lot of what you purchased, um, you would get uh, on the street, whether it's your clothing or basic food stuffs, you know, street vendors are the ones who are able to kind of bring those products right into these, especially, um, you know, very densely populated, largely immigrant neighborhoods. Yeah, the book here says there's about 10,000 people at that time in Lower Manhattan, whether that's accurate, I'm not sure. But there's also prepared food. So on one hand, you have the ingredients that you might use at home that street vendors would go door to door with, um, things like produce. But here we have gingerbread. There's also a hot muffins vendor that's featured and then baked pears. And this is interesting. We do have some vendors that are featured in this children's book um, who are people of color in this case it's a, a a young girl who's black and this is interesting we see this in this um children's book source as well as in a source that we're going to look at um just after this section and you know in this time period you have um a gradual kind of a, a emancipation there's um in 1799 um new york state sort of uh passes this gradual kind of emancipation. So what this meant is that there were some people who um, were black who were enslaved, but there were also people who were free. And we don't really know from the images that are shared from this time period sort of what the situation is for these folks. Yeah, and so I, for those who, who don't know, you know, slavery um, was still legal in New York State all the way up until 1827. Um, so 1808, this is a period, you know, in between the passage of the first manumission, but it's still, it's gradual over time. So we don't know what the status of people depicted in this book are necessarily. And then there's some vendors that are featured in the book that have certain skills um, and tools. So in this case, there's a grinder and we even if have vendors live, that do this today. Yeah, if you live in Park Slope, you probably know the, uh, the, the knife guy, or maybe you have one in your neighborhood as well. So knife grinders. Um, and this brings us up to another source um, that's uh, taking us back to this time period. And this is especially interesting um, because it's a, a gentleman who was a tinsmith for most of his life. His name was William P. Chapel. Um, Andrew's taking the hot dog costume off for a dog. She's freaking out. <laughs> but um, I, so uh, William P. Chapel, he was a tinsmith for most of his life. Um, but he, by the time he was uh, a senior citizen, he became an amateur painter. And in the 1870s, he decided to do a whole series that brought to life kind of his memories of uh, Lower Manhattan back circa 1808, uh, could be stretching into the 1810s as well. Um, so there's an exhibit at the Met uh, several years back uh, about this and you can see he even locates each of the vendors that he highlights and it's not just vendors, you can see he's also highlighting chimney sweeps um, and other kind of working people. So this is 60, 70 years later, but it's depicting the same time period as the Cries of New York book. That's right, that's right. And so here we have a strawberry peddler that you can see here. And um, this, it, it's a, a strawberry peddler that likely 
purchase the strawberries from a local market. Um, in some cases, um, vendors would go out and actually pick berries and just sell the berries that they had picked. Um, and what's neat about this collection, if you go to the next one, is that you can see these are um, uh, on the back, he identified, you can see this was the east side of Allen Street. So um, there's even sort of like that geographical identification, which I think yeah. is really neat. And this is a time you wouldn't have to go too far uptown to find forests, you know, to find places you could forage on the island of Manhattan. But I think it also highlights another theme that we're going to touch on at several different points, um, which is the theme of nostalgia. Yes. You know, having this looking back at, at, at street vendors uh, in this sort of nostalgic way, um, which is what William Chappell was doing, you know, depicting these images from, from his childhood. Yeah, it's sort of like what makes New York, New York. Right. And you see street vendors are a big part of that going back yeah. years and years. Um, here we have a, a, another vendor. So this is a, a buttermilk uh, peddler. Um, so again, this is a, a, another vendor and also a, a person of color um, who's vending out in the streets. Um, we have another sort of baked pear vendor, and this uh, would have been at Dwayne and Hudson. And in fact, there's a, a recollection um, that the vendor had carried around in deep glazed earthenware dish, uh, delicious. The, the pears were floating deliciously in a warm bath of homemade syrup, which yeah. sounds wonderful. And again, you know, back to since since we we've seen a number of African American figures depicted in these paintings. Um, and in the children's book as well, you know, it would also have been common for people to work as street vendors, um, you know, even if they were um, free people, um, because, you know, if someone becomes, as they said, emancipated or manumitted, they probably did not have a whole lot of options in terms of supporting themselves. So street vending is something, and again, a theme that we're going to turn to again and again um, is, uh, you know, why do people um, engage in street vending, um, you know, and why it's so important um, as, as a livelihood for so many people that may lack um, other economic opportunities. So that's a theme that we see go back, going back hundreds of years here in New York City. Um, and this here, uh, I think is one of our last uh, vendors that will be featuring from William P. Chappell's series. And this is a hot corn seller. And what's key about this that's similar to street vendors today is the location. This was a busy intersection of Chatham, Doyers, Bowery, and Catherine Streets, um, which today would be in Chinatown. And that was where a stagecoach would transport riders to and from Westchester. Hmm. So this was a key location for this vendor to set up, set up and sell her hot corn. And it also probably highlights that this is food Food on the street is something that's eaten by everybody uh, as well, you know, regardless of their of their class. Um, so hopefully, from looking at these images, you take away, you know, what some of the foods were for basically the, you know, seventeenth, eighteenth, uh, and well into the nineteenth century. Two of the key foods, or a few of the key foods you would have found, would have been hot corn. That was a big one. Oysters. Um, baked pears and, and things like that. So pretty different menu and we'll talk about how and why the menu of street food has evolved over time. Uh, as Carly just mentioned that some of the key scenes from The Godfather Part Two uh, give the nostalgia for the, for the old uh, New York. Um, oh, and this is another uh, this is buttermilk. Bread. Oh, bread, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the kind of evolution of, of street vending um, you know, especially as we get into the second half uh, of the 19th century. Now, this is a political cartoon, uh, actually a lithograph that was uh, uh, printed by a guy named James Bailey uh, in 1844. Um, and so this depicts uh, right outside City Hall in Lower Manhattan. Um, and, you know, why I wanted to show this uh, is because, you know, you can see the kind of treatment um, that people just trying to make a living vending on the street um, had faced. And unfortunately, throughout the history, you know, you see similar language coming from people, you know, talking about street vendors. Um, and so this is actually, you know, made by a printer uh, who is actually kind of attacking a rival printer who was, you know, sort of on a campaign uh, against street vendors. But you can um, see what these gentlemen uh, are saying to them. She says, you know, I'm just trying to live. And they say, what right have you to live? Come and clear out. Uh, so you often see this kind of um, 
the attitude of the authorities, the attitude of polite society towards street vendors, um, and this idea of regulating street vendors, what is a respectable profession and what isn't. Um, so you can see it's the, it's the prerogative of these men in top hats to come you know, and, and throw these people's um, wares on the street and these respectable people along this, uh, the side of the road um, saying, I'm, you know, I'm so glad that these disgusting beings will no longer offend the eyes of pious and respectable people. Um, so this is 1844, um, and obviously over the next couple of decades, um, New York City would go through some pretty dramatic changes, um, namely immigration would increase uh, dramatically and, and people coming from other parts of the world will, would start to arrive uh, in New York. And really street vending is in many ways a reflection of the patterns of immigration and the demographics of the city. Uh, and so as those change, street vending changes. Um, and so as we get into the 1880s, you know, we see large numbers of people coming from Southern Europe and from Eastern Europe, especially uh, many of these people looking for, uh, you know, a way to survive, looking for a livelihood, they turn to street vending um, and not wanting to be subjected to this type of, uh, of, of abuse, um, they start to organize themselves. And so um, for a long, long time, you know, going back to probably the 1700s, we haven't pinned it down exactly the date, but there had been um, this uh, convention in New York City, something called the 30 minute rule. Uh, which was, if you had a push cart like this, you could not be in one location for more than 30 minutes. Um, as the streets became more packed with vendors and the tenements became more packed with people, it wasn't really uh, feasible to move around all the time because you had vendors you know, right next to e each other. And so 1886 is the first example of when vendors really start to organize themselves um, and they decide we're all gonna go to one place and, and we're not gonna move and we're gonna ignore the 30 minute rule. Um, and this was on Hester Street. And they do this, you know, to set up kind of a, an open air market. I mean, yep. that's really by gathering together, banding together, it becomes a shopping destination for people that are in their neighborhood. Yeah. And there's sort of this, uh, you know, mutual security that they get from all being together rather than if they are just sort of, um, you know, individuals uh, on the street. Um, so from here, we start to see a number of open air push cart markets emerge. Um, and eventually they become sanctioned uh, by the city of New York and they become really these shopping districts, these destinations for people. Um, this is a great example of vendors organizing in a more formal way. Um, this is an article from 1898 um, and it talks about the Citizens Peddlers Association of Greater New York uh, in which peddlers start to organize and they say outright, you know, we are going to ignore the 30 minute rule and we are demanding demanding that we receive fair and equal treatment uh, from the authorities. Um, and so when I read this article, I just had visions of, you know, what, what's been happening uh, with the street vendor projects, you know, over the last almost 20 years that they've been organizing vendors. Um, the other interesting thing is they say in here that we are 20,000 peddlers strong in this city. Uh, our license entitled us to stand 30 minutes in one place. That's half an hour. We want to show the police that they can't stop us from standing 30 minutes in one place. Um, that's we actually talk about that number all the time that today there's probably about 20,000 vendors in the city as well, but only a small handful of those are actually able to get licenses today. So um, I just, I found this article today and kind of like chills ran down my spine when I read it. I'm like, oh my God, it's, it's really kind of the legacy of the, that the street vendor project is carrying on today. Um, Another important moment uh, is in 1894, um, which is when New York City or New York State passes a law. If you've been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art or if you've been down to Hudson Yards, you may have seen vendors that are advertising this, which is that they are veteran owned vendors. Uh, in 1894, New York State passed a law that uh, permitted uh, wounded veterans, obviously mostly from the Civil War, um, to basically vend anywhere on the state's, quote, highways and byways without a license. Um, and so this is now continued today. It was sort of passed as a way for, um, you know, 
rather than give them, you know, better medical benefits or better social security, they said, oh, well, you can, you know, apply a trade on the street, sort of this 19th century version of, of social security. Um, but that law is still on the books. And, and still today, um, veterans are entitled to a special class of permits um, for vending. But it also highlights another theme that we're going to see um, throughout this history, which is that you often find that um, Vending, there, you have more and more people that are becoming vendors in times of crisis, and it's also the time when you see more regulation, stricter regulation of vendors. Um, many people don't know this, um, but in 1894, we were in the middle of a depression, um, which started the year before and it lasts until 1897. So this is a period of actually major economic upheaval. So a lot of veterans were probably thrown out of work. And so this is a way that the state could, you know, allow them to support themselves in, in some way. Um, we'll kind of breeze through this a little bit, but this, this is an example of the city kind of formalizing more its relationship with vendors. Um, you know, in the uh, late 19th century, they start to license vendors to officially recognize these open air pushcart markets, but they're still trying to regulate them, force them into certain areas and corridors. Um, this is a photo from 1915, so World War I, uh, where they set up these open air pushcart markets underneath the overpasses of various bridges um, into Manhattan. And this was really an effort, like there have been outdoor pushcart markets, but it's really like the city kind of takes those spaces and makes them city operated. Right. So now you need to get a permit to go to the place that where you were vending anyway before. At certain points in time, they also regulate them where um, they would give you a paper license, but they would also give you special wheels that were painted a different color. So oh, this was in the 30s. In the 30s, yeah, yeah, so yeah. the inspectors could, could see if you uh, were a licensed vendor just by the wheels of your car. They only did it for about a year because it was a green wheel, I think it was green wheels. Um, but then vendors who were very creative would just like paint their wheel right. and like. <laughs> it's not like you can't get paint. Um, <laughs> But uh, so this is an image that shows some of the open air uh, pushcart markets. And you can see the concentration in certain areas, like for example, uh, East Harlem over here. Um, and then of course, uh, in the Lower East Side and then some in the Bronx around Arthur Avenue and things like that. Um, we had a question here from Ruth that said, are you aware of 97 Orchard Street? Uh, well, Cindy uh, worked for five years at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. So that's a place that we're really, really familiar with uh, for sure. Oh. Um, and do you, do you recall of any residents who were there who were street vendors? Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there were um, many people that lived in 97 Orchard Street, I believe, but I can't remember off the top of my head, it's been a long time. Just, if folks aren't aware of the Tenement Museum, or maybe you are, but you don't know exactly how it works, they really interpret the stories of the people that specifically lived in that building. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of this microcosm of the Lower East Side, you know, from the 1860s through the 1930s. Um, but so this is 1923. Um, you know, there are a lot of these open air push cart markets. Um, you know, we also have um, an economic downturn after World War I uh, in the early 20s, um, but we're gonna get into the Great Depression. And this is another time period when a lot of people are kind of entering the, um, entering street vending because they've been thrown out of work. And so they're just trying to support themselves. Um, and you also see a lot of, um, you know, native born Americans entering this industry that had for such a long time been, been dominated uh, by immigrants. Um, but this is another really incredible story. This is a period of time that's also well documented um, during the depression because of the Works Progress Administration, the Federal Writers Project um, documented all sorts of different stories of vendors. And, and these are, this is a group of vendors that we found um, that were up in, uh, up in East Harlem. Um, mm -hmm. So, and this is from 1938. So I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit about, about them. Yeah. So some of these, um, so this was um, mostly a group that was made up of African-American men, um, many of whom had been uh, engineers or had worked in different professions, but had lost their jobs during the depression. And so rather than rely on home relief at the time, um, they decided to kind of band together and they had their own peddler's colony where they would go out uh, at nighttime um, and look for different items that they could either resell or uh, at pool, they could wholesale or resell. Um, and then they also set up their own unemployment fund. And so they, it was sort of this 
whole organization of mutual support that existed at that time. Yeah, and so they, um, this, uh, this photographer um, went out and, and kind of documented their story. And uh, it's, it's a really incredible document uh, from, from the Library of Congress. Um, so, you know, obviously we know about the, the Hoovervilles and these sort of informal economies that emerged um, or expanded um, during the Great Depression, but this is an example of one that was actually, you know, pretty well documented uh, thanks to this project. Yeah, and that was it. The gentleman that documented this was Frank Bird. He was a folklorist, um, and so not only did he document sort of this uh, colonies, the peddler's colony story, but he also documented a lot of the calls and songs um, that were used by vendors in Harlem, including here, um, a vendor that was selling sweet potatoes. Um, so that's the Works Progress Administration at that time, not only they have writers, but as we'll see in the next image, there's another artist who did wood engravings and he has various depictions um, showing street vendors that are out in the city, um, which includes this one here. This is in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection. It's Lou Barlow. And here we have a, a sweet potato man. We don't know exactly where. Um, but I just, I, I love this work of art and also yeah. just sort of the fabrication of the cart itself and yeah. the ingenuity that goes These are that. carts that used to be, they were wood fired. And so they would have like a big bundle of scrap wood that they would collect to cook their potatoes. And then you can see the drawers down here, sort of like they would roast them in these, in these uh, cabinets here um, and that big stove pipe right there. A um, couple things I just wanted to mention here. Uh, which is, um, Dan, thank you for pointing it out. Max Marcus was a resident of 97 Orchard who was a street vendor when we did a program about Max Marcus. So I should have remembered that. Well, I know he ended up in the Essex Market. And he market. ended up in the Essex Market, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, you know, if you're wondering what happened to um, this uh, peddler's colony, um, basically that land was taken by the city uh, in the 1940s uh, and became the Abraham Lincoln houses. So it was taken over for urban renewal and, and public housing. You know, it kind of reminds me, reminds me a little bit uh, of the saga of Willits Point uh, next to City Field. If, if you know this area, um, famous for all of its auto repair shops there that has been whittled away as they're trying to build this mega development there. Um, and actually, I should just mention that the Urban Justice Center, which the Street Vendor Project is part of, uh, worked to try and get those, um, get those uh, repair shops uh, relocated or get some compensation. So, you know, it's it kind of, as soon as I learned about this story, it kind of echoed the story of Willett's Point uh, to me, but we won't go into depth uh, on that. Um, so 1930s, the depression, lots of people become street vendors, but again, it's a time when you see more and more regulation and the city is trying to um, in their words, rationalize um, the food distribution system. So they build a whole network of wholesale food markets um, as well as retail food markets. So that map that we showed um, where they had, um, you know, where you saw the concentration of open air push cart markets, those areas um, would become the home um, for a network of, of 10, um, uh, 10 indoor markets, um, four of which are still in operation today. And what's really interesting about this time period in the 30s is not only are they setting up the system and they're starting to rethink how they license for street vending, um, but they put into place restrictions where you can only really gain access to a stall in a public market or even certain peddling licenses if you're a naturalized citizen, uh, you're showing that you're naturalizing or you're a US citizen. And so this ends up putting some people, uh, newer kind of immigrants in a precarious position. Yeah. So speaking of the ingenuity of the, the sweet potato cart, this takes us into, we're gonna, uh, this sort of last part of the program today, we're gonna talk about innovation um, and uh, transformation in the industry. And this also has to do with the food. You know, part of the reason why certain foods uh, were served on the street, it wasn't just because that's the food people wanted to eat. It was also, you know, what can be transported? You know, what can you store safely and carry around easily and is of, you know, relatively high value um, that you can make a little bit of money on. Um, without having to, you know, schlep too much stuff. Uh, and so as the technology changes uh, with the push cart, um, the menu changes as well. Um, and so this is a great example of, uh, you know, another 
story of a the immigrant family um, that really innovated so much. And, and the, the street scene that we see today is uh, in large part a result of the work that they did. Yeah, and so we're seeing here, this is a newspaper article and you can see Jack Beller on the left and his father, Ed Beller on the right. And Ed, uh, he emigrated to the United States when he was 17 years old. He fled Austria uh, as a young man um, in 1938. Um, and ended up eventually uh, in the New York area. Um, and he and a friend, um, Mark Moneys, decide to go into business together. Um, and they uh, were in a space uh, at 16 Catherine Street um, in Manhattan. And they were in a, the space that they moved into, they were doing metal fabrication. Um, and there was a vendor that stepped into the shop and asked them if they could make a cart. And it just so happened that they had taken over the space of a business that had been there for almost 50 years that had been making wooden push carts. And so they, um, you know, started to fabricate. Uh, they were making like the metal compartments that you would put into like a hot dog cart, for example. But they were pretty much, we think, the first to kind of come up with the idea of the stainless steel push cart, which is what we're looking at here. And you compare that with the wooden style. So we can see this earlier model, like from the 1930s, they started their business in the late 40s. Um, so we see here, it's sort of drawing from this design concept. And you can see the next one is also a wooden cart. Uh, this is one of the most traditional carts where you would literally kind of cook right where you pushed the cart. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you store sort of the hot dog buns up on top, which are cooking right in front of you um, and heating up those hot dogs. We can see this here. Um, and then back to their kind of design that they come up with. And this business um, ends up sort of partnering up with another classic um, New York business, Worksman Cycles, which had been around since the eight, late 1890s. And what they had done, we can see Worksman Cycles wooden wheel Mm -hmm. And then the body of this cart, which this is actually would have been up on uh, Steinway, um, up in, in Queens. Um, so these two businesses ended up working a lot together. Worksman Cycles was founded in Lower Manhattan, and they had come up with the idea of a tricycle to kind of replace the um, uh, kind of cart, horse and cart right. Model of street vending. So, so kind of Admar, you know, um, they developed a stainless steel hot dog cart, and Worksman Cycles actually developed the tricycle for good humor. Yes. So you have these kind of iconic street foods, these two companies, and now they're now they're one company brought together. Um, this I love this. This is like a throwback. Kind yeah. Of, uh, kind of cart. That well, they, they still they still, they still make, make them. They still yeah. make these hot dog carts. So Worksman Cycles, they now they build their bicycles and tricycles down in South Carolina, but. Um, it's now called 800 by cart or Admar. Um, they still make them in, in Ozone Park in, in Queens. Um, this is another great story. Um, this is uh, Sylvia uh, and her son, Ernie Wong. Um, they're great supporters of the Street Vendor Project. Um, and so their company uh, is called um, Shanghai Stainless. Uh, and they um, you know, started the company back in the 70s actually fabricating um, stainless steel kitchens for Chinese restaurants. Um, and then over time, they started to get into the street vending um, business. Uh, and so now they, they largely fabricate um, carts and trucks. Um, what's interesting, though, is uh, they, and I can show you that outside of their business, so they're in Williamsburg, so they're still located there today. Uh, now they, um, they, they, it's believed that they actually developed um, or built some of the first stand-in food carts. Um, so if you see a food cart today, like we saw with MD's cart, he's standing inside of it. It's about 10 feet long, about five feet wide. You can fit a lot more kitchen equipment in there than you could with some of those simple push carts. So it was this innovation that really allowed people to start putting in full service kitchens um, inside the inside their, their street car. Um, so this happened in the 1990s and it really allowed a huge expansion of, of menus and the diversity of, of cuisine that you could serve on a cart. Yeah, and one of my favorite details about this is for a very long time, really up until the early 2000s, in terms of their designs, you'd sit down with Ernie and um, he'd like sketch out or they do, their staff would do hand sketches 
to show you yep. different possible designs for your cart or truck. Um, and then they'd pass it along to their team and they'd be able to eyeball it and yeah. fabricate the cart. And they really customize every cart. So they talk through your menu and your recipe to figure out what the workflow is. Um, because you have a lot of people that might be in a very, very small space. So like we saw MD before, it was just him on the cart. That cart could have four people inside that space working on it right. at one time. So you want to have things that are efficiently uh, located. And now, now so, like many of the businesses, they use computer aided design, but um, yeah. you know, but they have that skill. It's and so in this time in the eighties and the nineties, food is starting to change. Um, you're not just seeing hot dogs and pretzels on the street. Um, and again, immigration patterns are, are changing as well. This is a time, you know, after World War II, many of the people that are working in this industry uh, are Greek, uh, but that's starting to change. And this is an article from 1983, uh, where it says that they're challenging the former monopoly of the all-American hot dog. Falafel, zetbele, souflaki, tacos, Belgian waffles, sesame, bialy, Afghanistan, kofta, Szechuan noodles, fantail shrimps. Uh, name your gastronomic pleasure, and some enterprising sidewalk entrepreneur will be only too willing to serve it up on the run. Um, and again, early 1980s, this is a time period, and actually it mentions it in this article, um, that there's really high unemployment. Um, the economy is not doing great at this time. And so they interview a number of people who have decided to take up street vending, but it's also the time of, of really intense regulation. I think you have to point out there, oh, yeah. there I've never seen this before, <laughs> but if you look at the last paragraph, it says that there was a cart that featured horse meat burgers um, that, that made a brief appearance on Lexington Avenue um, back in the 1950s. I just, I felt that was worth mentioning yeah. <laughs> since it's on the screen. Um, and so this is a time in the 1980s as well um, that you see uh, the emergence of what is really the most ubiquitous cuisine of, of New York street food today, and that is halal food. Um, and this is uh, Fatima Khan. Uh, we mentioned her, this is a vendor that we've worked with for a long time. And for many years, she was just uh, across Sixth Avenue from, uh, from MD. Um, but she opened her cart in 1987. Uh, and she claimed, probably correctly, that she was the first halal vendor uh, in New York City. And she says that because when she applied for her license, uh, they said, what's halal food? And she had to explain it to them. Now, I think if someone at the Department of Health had said, what's halal food, they'd probably look for another job. But um, she uh, she's actually from Trinidad. Um, but uh, she served that kind of uh, classic combination that you find today of like we saw before, um, lamb or chicken, uh, on rice with some combination of white sauce and hot sauce. And um, sometimes with fish too. And so, oh, and they, salt oh fish. my God, they serve salt <laughs> fish, they serve doubles, they serve all sorts of different food. So uh, Fatima actually ran this business with seven different sons who all worked on the cart at, a, at one point in time, um, but they decided to retire the cart a couple of years ago. So they're not around anymore, but I wanted to acknowledge her as, as really the pioneer of halal food that you see everywhere. And again, in the 80s and 90s, you see more people from places like Egypt, like Bangladesh, um, coming and, uh, and coming to New York City and, and vending uh, on the street. And you really do see, too, that there's, you know, on one hand, it's office workers yep. in a place like Midtown or the Financial District, but also taxi drivers yep. and people that, you know, they'll call out their order and then circle the block or try to find a place to park. And so, it, you know, they're really feeding the city and feeding people on the move. Yeah. So a couple questions we have here, which is that, um, uh, are there any references about the history of halal street food in New York City? There was actually a book that was written about the history of halal street food a couple of years ago. It's not specifically to New York City, um, but I'll, I have to look up the name of the author. Um, but that's that's the one resource that, that I can think of. It's A lot of it is kind of folk, folklore, like the story of Fatima right. that hasn't been you know authoritatively documented yet. The other question we got is, uh, do vendors shell, sell knishes, specifically Jonas Schimmel's knishes? It's a funny story. Knishes are not a popular food item uh, for vendors to sell. And the reason why is because they're really hard to keep at temperature. So uh, if they fall below a certain temperature, you can get dinged with a health code violation that can be unsafe. And they're much harder to keep at temperature than, than hot dogs or other products. So their, their popularity has actually fallen, fallen off. Um, yeah, that's why you might not see as many knishes yeah. uh, from carts, but I, you know, there certainly is the technology if you're able to right. invest in that, but yeah. 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 Um, and then this is the last image that we want to show. I know we're, we're just about out of time, uh, which is, you know, 1983. 
Um, this is also the time when we have the passage of a vending law that we're, we're still living with today. Um, so under the Ed Koch administration, um, they placed a cap on the number of vending permits that were available. Uh, and so it actually was estimated that there are about 8,500 permits before the cap was put in place. And then the cap brought that down uh, to 3,000. Um, so Mayor Koch was someone who really campaigned against street vendors, trying to get them off of a lot of uh, major streets, especially Manhattan, but also in Brooklyn. Um, and this is something that we've seen up to the present. So that cap that was put in place um, all those years ago, it's still in place now. And the Street Vendor Project and other organizations are really pushing um, to get that cap, cap lifted. So um, we're going to see here if Karina is still with us. And so we're going to bring her back on. Um, to talk a little bit about this campaign and other ways that you can get involved and support the Street Vendor Project. Hi everyone again, back here with MD. We were just watching along and thank you so much. That was fascinating. <laughs> and um, yeah, we were chatting as, um, as you were going on and talking about the cap that's been in place since the 80s. And, it has not it has not changed there are only 3,000 citywide food vendor permits um and only you know this is food vendors and then there's also for general merchandise vendors so for folks who sell um hats jewelry clothes um they there's only 853 of those licenses and we estimate that there's about 20,000 total vendors in new york city so you can see how many people are considered part of the formal economy, right? Considered small businesses. That's even something we're still struggling for recognition. But then there's, you know, tens of thousands of small business owners who are not able, they're simply not able, even if they wanted to get a permit. And most of them do because no one wants to be harassed by the police. No one wants to be ticketed for trying to work. Everyone wants to be able to start their small business. Um, and for folks who aren't able to get one, the only way to do it and operate legally is to rent a permit on the black market or on the, on the underground market. So from people who may have gotten the permit, you know, decades ago, and now in order to get one, you have to rent. So MD, I'm actually going to ask you to share with us about your, your permit that you have now. Can you explain um, how you got your permit? But the permit I have it right now, we rent it. Rent it as like eighteen thousand, eighteen thousand dollars for the rent. But if we this time, we cannot make this much money. So how to pay with them and then with the license? You know, if we if we have a license, we can able to at least work. Everybody should get a license and everybody should be work. So they don't have to hard work money lose it. But we lose all the money we make it, and they gain. Whoever has a permit, they don't need to work. They just sell the permit and they survive. And us, we have to hard work that and give it to the money to the who is the permit owner. So I request for these people, whoever people working in the as a vendor, to let them keep the permit as a worker, because we don't have any project, we don't have any help. So at least they can help us as a permit license so we can come outside and we can work yes we need to help each other thank you md yeah so you know as md was saying he pays eighteen thousand dollars a year to rent a permit but to actually get one through the city it only costs two hundred dollars and so especially in times that are as difficult as this we you know this is now or never we really need to have you know permits that are accessible for people to have to, to have their small business operate so we actually have a bill um, in a bill in city council right now called intro 1116 and uh, yes I see Pete you got it intro 1116 so this is a bill that would um, introduce 4,000 new mobile food vendor permits over the course of 10 years and so that would be a huge, huge step towards, you know, recognizing vendors as small businesses and giving them the tools that they need in order to operate. 
Um, we have uh, 30 sponsors within the council and we are really pushing for this to come up for a vote. And so we need your support. Um, I, I know Fatai just linked into the chat. There's a tweet in here that says a little bit of information and we'd love for you to, to share that on social media so we can show our elected officials that there is a widespread of support um, behind, behind legalizing street vendor small businesses. Um, and we also save the date, August 13th, we will be having an action in Times Square. So again, follow us on our social media or sign up for our newsletter um, through the website and we'll share some more information as it comes through. Karina, thank you so much. Um, this was really awesome and, and big thanks to, to MD as well for, for sharing his story um, and really giving us a sense of, of what it's like um, to, to work in this industry. Uh, so many people depend on these vendors, uh, whether for their jobs or for great meals or all the other different industries that they support. The fabrication, the food distribution, all of that are businesses and jobs here in New York City. This is really a, a hyper-local industry um, that supports so many people. So um, th thank you so much for all, all of your great work. Thank you. I mean, this only, we're only going to be changing things if we're all working towards this together, right? So this is huge. And thank you for all the information that you were sharing tonight. I learned so much. And thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and for supporting the Street Vendor Project and all the street vendors of New York City. Yeah. So support your local street vendor. Come visit MD this weekend. He'll be out here. <laughs> 44th and 6th, come through. Yeah, and, and stay tuned to the Street Vendor Project for our, our next event in, in August. Um, so we are really looking forward to that. Um, and, and thank you all so much. Thank you to Fatai uh, for producing and answering some of the questions that we didn't get to. Um, and thank you to the whole uh, team at the Street Vendor Project and the volunteer committee that helped to make this happen. And of course, we can't do this without all of you. And so we hope that you'll join for the upcoming virtual program fundraisers that the Street Vendor Project will be doing in the coming months. Yeah. Uh, we'll get one more shot of the. Uh, oh, of the here food. we go. Make you all hungry. <laughs> so we'll, we'll go out with uh, with some uh, with some chicken tikka. <laughs> all right. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Bye.